it's always out to mind You're the guy fighting for the one every time Welcome to Skyline Church, everybody. I'm Jeremy McGarity. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's an honor to have you at the service today. I wanted to let you know some of the things that you can expect today. One, you need to relax. I hope you can relax. There's going to be some humor. There's going to be some laughter. There's going to be a message from the Word of God that's going to be very practical to your life. You're going to be able to apply it literally today. Also, there's going to be some worship happening. What is worship? Very simply, we're going to be singing songs to the Lord out of our heart gratitude for what he's done in our lives. There's several things going on at Skyline Church that, man, you have an opportunity to get involved in. And I want you to see some of those things that are happening right now. Thanks again for joining us. God bless you guys. Hey everybody, I am so excited to let you know about all the different services that we have coming up for Easter weekend. We've got about 15 of them, so hang tight. Here we go. Good Friday services, 5 and 7 p.m. at Rancho Campus. We have a 5 p.m. at the Lakeside Campus. And then in Kansas City and Tennessee campuses, we have a 7 p.m. Good Friday services. And then let's talk about Easter Sunday. He is risen. We're so excited. We have a Saturday 5 p.m. service at Rancho. Then we have a Sunday 8.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 11.30 a.m., 1 p.m. service. And in Lakeside, we're at Saturday at 7 p.m. I'm very excited to be there live Saturday at 7 p.m. Sunday, 8.30 a.m., 10 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. in Lakeside, Kansas City and Tennessee, 10.30 a.m. You guys, it's gonna be fantastic. It's gonna be phenomenal. Last year, we baptized over 250 people. We expect more this year, so join us. We can't wait to have you with us at one of our campuses, including our online campus as well on Easter Saturday or Sunday or Good Friday services as well. God bless you guys. You gotta shout it from the mountain 
Strong. 
He'll fix my eyes on Jesus Christ. I'll say that it is well. Come on. Oh, I know that. that wonderful worship. We're kicking off Holy Week. Palm Sunday is today. It comes a little earlier this year, so it's a little different, isn't it? And so we welcome in our campuses everywhere. Thank you guys for joining us, everybody. In Lakeside, our Lakeside Church family, our Tennessee Church family, Kansas City, Arizona, and our online church community, including a Jim Harbaugh in Los Angeles. So let's go ahead and welcome everybody in. I got several things I wanna let you know about and grab your notes because all of the service times that are coming up are on the back of your notes. You just have to hit that QR, QR code on all of our campuses. So Good Friday is uh, the beginning 
of that weekend where we're going to have a bunch of services over the course of that weekend. And depending on which campus you're a part of, you can hit that QR code and you'll know the Good Friday service times and the Saturday, if it's relevant to your campus, Saturday or Sunday service times. And we're really excited about all that God is going to do over Easter weekend. We know it's always a very big weekend in terms of people making that either first step in obedience to the Lord and accepting the Lord or in baptism as we've mentioned that we've had over 250 baptism on Easter last year and we'd love to see more of that this year. So don't forget, Easter is not just for us, right? We get to have the opportunity to worship the Lord and remember what he did for us, but there are a lot of people that right now don't know the Lord and they're in your oikos. Those are people in your relational network and mine that we need to be inviting this Easter. And this is one of two times that these folks that will never come to church are most likely to come to church. So this is like low-hanging fruit opportunity to be able to invite. Don't forget that. And that's what this invite card is for. Make sure you grab some of these. There's some in your program, but on your way out, we have more on the, um, you know, everywhere at all of our campuses. As you exit, there's a table and there should be more there as well that you can grab and just hand out and get them out there any way possible. Lakeside Church Campus, I look forward to being with you in person on Saturday, 7 p.m. I can't wait to see everybody over there in Lakeside. And then for our Kansas City and our Tennessee campuses, I'm coming out there in May. I can't wait to see you guys in May and more details will follow as well. So guys, we're very, very excited about that. And over the course of this Easter season, we've been talking about one day to feed the world. This is a powerful thing. I just got back from a meeting with Convoy of Hope this week, and it was very powerful to be reminded of the crisis that is happening in our rural communities in America, but also all the way over in East Africa where it hadn't rained in four years, and there's a tremendous drought going on. And we got to hear testimonies of people that were on the ground and actually making a difference. And remember, they don't just drop food. They train those villages. They train those people how to farm, how to produce 30, 40, 50% crops versus what they have been producing and they're able to teach them how to run a business and it's amazing work that's going on right now convoy of hope is feeding over 555,000 kids every single day that's our partner and we partner with them every time you give part of that goes to helping feed starving children all over the world so we took this initiative up because we've been partnering with convoy for about five years now and this one just takes it to a whole nother level And $10, a $10 gift will feed a child for a month. And so what we've said is, let's go ahead and let's do this together. One day to feed the world is one day's wage. You take your salary, you take your income, and you just divide that by 365. What does that come out to for one day? And we're asking you to give that on Easter. There are envelopes in the back on your way out if you wanna get ready and prepared for that. The thing about it is make sure you make the checks out to Skyline Church, and then we're gonna send all that stuff into Convoy of Hope. This is an important initiative that we will receive that offering on Easter, and it's gonna be a powerful Easter offering. We're very excited about that. Let's take a look at this video real quick. It all comes down to one. Since it was founded almost 30 years ago, Convoy of Hope has always believed in the significance of one. We know that one person, one church, or one community, with God's help, has the power to create widespread change. And we know that one person giving generously can make a life-changing difference. Convoy's goal is to end the cycles of poverty and hunger in communities around the world. That's why we've intentionally looked at what makes the biggest difference in communities struggling with poverty. When you give one day to feed children through Convoy of Hope, you become part of the solution. With your help, Convoy partners with women as they start their own businesses and support their families. With Convoy of Hope's agricultural training and resources, local farmers' fields can take on new life when you give just one day's income. When you link arms with Convoy to provide disaster relief, hurting people receive the help and strength they need to get back on their feet. Civic organizations, churches, businesses, and government agencies come together at Convoy of Hope's community events to bring help and hope to families in need. From Australia's outback and Europe's ancient villages to America's heartland, the lifeblood of any nation is its small towns. 
Convoy of Hope is working to help rural communities thrive. Spiritual development is ingrained in everything we do. Convoy of Hope strives to work through and empower the local church. By taking part in one day, we're helping kids, families, and entire communities on their journey toward brighter futures. Because in the end, it all comes down to one. One vision, one driving passion, one day. So we're very excited to be able to make that difference, and we've been asking you for the few weeks to be praying about what God would say to you. Maybe it's one day, maybe it's more than that, but whatever it is, we know it's going to make a big difference in feeding, starving people in our country and across the world. So we're excited about that, and right now I'm excited. Get your notes out. We're going to have part two of Pastor Tom's message, so let's go ahead and put your hands together. Give a warm welcome to Pastor Tom Mercer. Mercer. You see, the closer we get to him and realize his demands, the more we're not sure. Jesus said, will you be made whole? Apparently, this man answered, yes, I want to be made whole. That's all you have to say, yes, I want to be made whole. Now, there are three important things that happen. You must have faith. Jesus said, rise. And when Jesus said rise by faith, he took that first step on those paralyzed legs and he walked. All right, thank you, Skyline family. Happy Palm Sunday. What a wonderful uh, opportunity to come down and hang around with uh, you all again and provide a second part to what we began last time. Uh, you know, when Pastor Jeremy asked uh, me to come these two weekends, he asked that I speak on something that could help prepare us for Easter. And I chose Jonah as the topic for that. And there is an obvious reason Yes, it's raining. Um, <laughs> yeah, feel, the, feel the tension in the room suddenly. Um, it is raining. Uh, what was I saying? I, there's an obvious reason why you would connect the dots between Jonah and Jesus. Uh, and Jesus alluded to it back in Matthew chapter 12. In verse 40, he, he said this, he said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man, Jesus, will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Jonah is what scholars call a type of Christ. The Old Testament is filled with events and different people whose life generally or specifically on a given day may have been foreshadowing what would take place in Jesus' life when he eventually showed up. And Jonah's one of those, one of those examples of what, what would also happen to Jesus. And so that's what he's alluding to. That's not why I connected the dots between Jonah and Easter, however, for our times together. Uh, we haven't even focused that much on, on the fish part of the story. Because this is more than a miraculous story about a fish. Last week we talked about the spiritual transformation of an entire very pagan city, but this is more than just a story about God's universal love for people. It's mostly a story about how God deals with people who claim to be his children but don't act like it. And that would be all of us. We can all relate to this. We can all see much of Jonah in our own lives more than we would like to admit, I'm sure, but it's there. But this is the bottom line. 
never bet against God's love for the people sitting in the front row seats of your life. And never ever bet against his ability to use us, his desire to use us, you and me, to change the world that he has assembled around us. Uh, just to bring you up to speed, in case uh, you were not with us uh, last, last weekend, in chapter 1, Jonah got clear instructions. God wanted him to go 600 miles northeast to the pagan city of Nineveh and declare they had 40 days to repent or God would authorize their destruction. Now, the text does not, interestingly, to me at least, it does not record a verbal response from Jonah about God's challenge. God said, go, and Jonah said, like nothing. But actions speak louder than what? Words. And Jonah booked a cruise 2,000 miles due west in the ab absolute opposite direction to the absolute end of the known world. That was a clear statement. And so God, he, he got a fish to go pick him up. And at the end of chapter two, the fish brought Jonah back. And then we get to chapter three, and Jonah finally declares the message God had originally asked him to take to that city. And to Jonah's great surprise, they repented. And their king even issued a decree ordering a complete and immediate move toward national repentance. It's actually the story, as we told you, of the largest mass conversion in recorded human history. And this is the way chapter 3 ends. Chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what the Ninevites did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Isn't that great? I mean, that's an awesome end to a story, man. I mean, that's the way we love every story to end. You know, you got Jonah, and he's kind of throwing a fit, and he has a little tantrum going on, and then God gets his attention, like, yeah. And he repents, and he obeys God, and then God unleashes the power of his love in an entire city is saved. Man, chapter three ended so great. If only the book of Jonah did not have a chapter four. Man, life would be good. But it does. And this is why. Chapter four is why he gave us chapters one through three. Chapter four is necessary to reveal what the real problem is here. It reveals what's going on inside Jonah's heart. See, Jonah's obedience, and that was the theme, how do you trigger God's power? Last time, it's his obedience that does that. He does what God says, and yikes. God puts the pedal to the metal and accomplish the greatest and the fastest national spiritual turnaround in the history of the planet. But there are two different tracks of divine intent in this story, and only one of them involves the sinful nation. The other involves this rebel prophet. You know, I think of your uh, front row, your oikos. You hear about that, I'm sure, from time to time. Whenever I do trainings on the oikos principle, I tell pastors, be annoyingly committed to this idea. And so maybe even Pastor Jeremy annoys you at times by reminding you of the people sitting in your front row. But there are two different tracks of divine intent here. One is for the people sitting in your front row. And the other is you. God is never content with outward obedience. 
Because what we do on the outside does not define who we are really. Outward obedience does not define you. What defines us is what's going on inside. You know, the Pharisees were high in obedience and low on integrity. Remember them? Jesus loved everybody, but he didn't get along with everybody, and that's why. The interesting thing is that what's going on on the inside eventually always comes outside. Can't contain it. I've often told, you know, the congregation I was privileged to lead for almost four decades, I often told them this. I said, time vets everything. In Matthew 7, Jesus put it this way, storm's coming and it will reveal the security of your foundation. I would tell that to you today. It's a whole different message. A storm is coming. That rain was so timely. But a storm is coming into your life. It may not involve water. It could involve a lot of things, a lot of crises, related issues. And that storm will reveal for the whole world who you really are. And that nice, big, single-story, mid-century modern that's the envy of everyone in your neighborhood could be washed away because what really matters, Jesus said, is what's going on underneath the superstructure of our lives. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, this is just a great comment about when the nation was trying to figure out who the king of the Jewish people should be. And it says in verse 7, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You know, bringing people to Jesus, like any other aspect of our obedience, is not just a matter of doing something on the outside. And I used to do the same thing that your pastor has encouraged you to do, to take an invitation card. I mean, from our vantage point, it's like, how hard is this? To invite somebody to come to Easter. But that outward act of obedience is not the important thing. Bringing people to Jesus is a matter of the heart. It's not just obedience God wants, like... He's got this insecurity, and he's got to get people to, to obey him. He isn't on some kind of power trip, just trying to get you to submit so that you could be reminded over and over again who's in charge here. And he certainly doesn't need our help for anything. Man. Man. When you get your head around that one, your life will be transformed. God could have always found another prophet to go to Nineveh. That was not a problem for God. He could get anyone he wants to bring someone in your front row to Christ. He didn't even need to put that oikos together for you. He could have put those people somewhere else. But God wants our heart to line up with his heart. And that's why he chose to use you here. In chapter 3, Jonah decided it was better to obey than disobey. Three days in the belly of a huge fish will do that to a man. But that does not mean that Jonah's heart... That does not mean that Jonah's heart was in the right place. When the Apostle Paul addressed those who lived under authority, he talked about the same thing in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. He said, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God. How? From your heart. Last time I told you, I got my little list of what your pastor says that is wise, little nuggets of truth. And he actually comes up with some pretty good stuff. I used to call him 
McGarrity's nuggets, now they're just McNuggets. And this is what he said, and it's been a few months. But he said, God will bless you when you give money to Skyline Church. But when you give money, whether or not God blesses you for it, then you're giving from the heart. You know, for years, I've often had conversations with people and different um, economic analysts, and they try to put the fear of God in pastors and say, well, you know, the IRS may take away your tax exempt status if you do the right thing, and then people won't get a deduction from their taxes to give. I didn't care. We don't give because we get a tax deduction. We don't give so that God will bless us. We give from our hearts because we're thankful to God for what he's done in our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, the Apostle Paul once again said, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion. God loves a, a cheerful giver. God loves those and uses those who are willing to give from the heart. And this is what Jesus asked the fellows. He said in Mark chapter 8, verse 17, are your hearts hardened? Are your hearts hard? You know, when you think about it, there are only two possible reasons you and I are ever disobedient. And I'm a very simple person. I'm very simple-minded. If it's not a simple idea, I don't understand it. That's why I just love reading the Bible. People say I read the Bible. but I would read the Bible, Pastor, but I, I just don't understand it. And I always respond under my breath. I'm much kinder in the way I respond to them. But I'm thinking, they haven't read it. Because virtually all of it is so simple to understand. I mean, there are passages that uh, we, none of us really get. And we have all these conversations about what they mean, but I don't know what percentage, maybe 95% of the scripture is like so simple. And so the concepts there are easy to break down. There are only two reasons why we disobey. Number one, ignorance. Or number two, a hardened heart. Either you don't know what to do to obey, or you don't want to do it. You know what to do, but you've decided, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I mean, what other options are there? Pastors, like your pastor, like, like Tom, we, we can help people with what piece of this? We can help people with ignorance. And we all have ignorance, some level of ignorance. We're trying to learn more about the scriptures. And, and there are some passages I could probably help alleviate your lack of understanding. I can do absolutely nothing about your heart and heart. This is above my pay grade. A hardened heart may be the most frustrating thing to God... And it's not because hardened hearts are so common, although they are, it's because they're so easy to mask through outward obedience. A hardened heart is insidious. It can take a hold of us. It can compromise our lives. And if not recognized, it can destroy our spiritual vitality. And all that can happen without us even being aware that it's happening. And that's why in Mark chapter 8, Jesus told the guys, he told the fellows, he said in verse 15, be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. See, yeast represents the principle of fermentation, which was actually the result of sin's presence in the physical world. It only takes a little bit of it to completely change the identity of the material it is mixed with. And that's why Jesus said, be careful. In fact, the, the word he chose there speaks of reflecting. Watch this. Reflecting on one's experience to draw the right conclusions for your next step. That's be careful. Harao in the Greek. In other words... <laughs> Jesus said, you all know this is true. Y'all got jacked up in the past 
for this very same reason. So let your next move reflect on that experience and be smarter this time. And the Apostle Paul explains why in Galatians chapter 5. It's because a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough, right? The Pharisees were the poster boys for this idea. I mean, they, they were never short on obedience to the law, but their obedience did not flow out of humility. It didn't flow out of godly humility. The story of Jonah provides an amazingly insightful example of behavioral obedience from a person with a hard heart. By watching and listening to Jonah, we, we can actually see here in this chapter, this last chapter, four characteristics of a hard heart, four stages maybe of a hardening heart. So we're going to pick up the action, chapter 4. And remember, God has just shown mercy to the Ninevites. He's, he's uh, relented regarding his judgment. And so Jonah's mission of preacher of prince to that city was a success. It was a resounding success. And in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. I mean, for the prophet, a prophet, any prophet, pick a prophet. This is better than anything else in life. This is bigger than the Super Bowl in our culture. The greatest national revival in history. I mean, a win that big against a team like the Ninevites. I mean, nobody, and I mean, nobody would have predicted that. Forget the miracle on ice. Forget the thriller in Manila. This is the phenomena in Nineveh. And somehow it still seemed wrong to Jonah. Okay. Here comes the yeast. Step number one, anger. Anger. A hard heart begins in an angry heart. And anger doesn't check itself. Listen to me very carefully. I know you're filling in blanks. Because, you know, that's outward obedience. It's very good, by the way. And if you do it with the right attitude, it's going to be transformational. But stop writing for a minute because I want you to look me in the eye when I say this. Your anger will not check itself. It never just goes away. It's like fire. Fire continues to burn until one of two things takes place. Until it runs out of fuel... Or somebody puts it out. So when it comes to your anger, here's a little advice from a 69-year-old pastor. Put it out. Because it will never run out of fuel. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, as is often the case in translation, and this is true um, wherever uh, you are, but in translation, there are different words in one language that are all translated the same way into the second language, and it might be a little bit confusing, or as they say, some things can get lost in translation. In the Greek New Testament, there are different words that in the English New Testament are all translated the same way. And if the intent was the same, they would have all been the same word in the Greek. But the intent was not the same. And there are several. And, and one is thumos. Thumos, and you can fill this blank in, that's rage. That's when you just lose it. It's a boiling, out-of-control anger it's never described as appropriate for God's people. And other people in your life will be the victims here. It is never described as appropriate at any level. A paragismos is another word. It's, it's the second anger of verse 26. It's, it's bitterness. It's the anger that seethes on the inside. It's the byproduct of jealousy or maybe a grudge or maybe an offense Whereas Thumas victimizes others, Paragismos victimizes you. 
It's like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. And then there's orge, another Greek word. It is the first anger of verse 26. It's how we feel when we recognize that something is compromising God's word or complicating God's desire to bless the people around us. And it just bothers us because people are doing the wrong thing. One guy said that Jonah prayed his best prayer in the worst place, the belly of a fish, and he prayed his worst prayer in the best place, right next to God's side as an entire civilization is saved. In the first prayer, he asked God to save him. And in the other prayer, he asked God to kill him. Oh, no. We should never, ever, ever think that our anger will serve us well. Verse 12, chapter 4, he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? When I was still in Jerusalem, the first time you told me to go to Nineveh, I knew this would happen. That's why I booked the cruise to Tarshish. I knew it. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God. I knew you were slow to anger and abounding in love. I knew you were a God who relents from sin and calamity. And so now, Lord, what I want you to do is kill me. Take away my life. For it is better for me to die now than to live in a world with saved Ninevites. Yeah, okay. Let's close in prayer. I'm just kidding. Your anger, where does that lead? Step number two, phase number two. It leads to self-justification. If you don't check your anger, that leads to self-justification. And this is just a classic lesson in that. Jonah truly believed he had a better idea than God did. I mean, stop and think about that. He tries to justify his disobedience. In other words, he tells God, I knew you'd do the wrong thing. I knew it. That's why I pushed back from the beginning. God, I was just trying to help you out here. I was just trying to help you see the error of your ways, the flaws in your plan. I would like to raise your hand if you would. In all all the campuses, wherever you're watching or listening, and even if you're just listening, nobody's watching you, still want you to do it. Raise your hand if you believe that the Bible is true, please. Raise your hand. Okay, thank you. You can put your hand down. Uh, Raise your hand if you believe we serve a God who has our best interest. He has your best interest at heart. Raise your hand. Okay, that's great. You guys are awesome. Isn't it funny how when our plans are clearly at odds with God's plan, even though we just raised our hand twice, and we walk out of an auditorium hearing a message, a challenge from the Word of God, and we hear it from the Word of God, the Spirit of God now wants to apply it in the lives of the people of God, but we walk out of here saying we're not going to do that because our ideas for our future are better than God's, even though we just raised our hand twice. Yeah, we're hopeless. Thank God you sent Jesus. Jonah said, I knew you'd you'd do that. Jonah knew his first choice, God's first choice, always to be gracious and compassionate. I mean, he knew the story of Moses. All the Jewish prophets, they, they read this stuff. Exodus chapter 34, God passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. Oh, this language sounds eerily familiar to Jonah chapter 4. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And Jonah's thinking, this whole thing, God, from the beginning was a scam. You sent me to proclaim a judgment you never intended to execute. When you think about it, God, Jonah speaking, when you think about it, I've been more consistent than you've been. No, anger doesn't just stop. It just keeps what? Burning. And it leads to self-justification. And then self-justification becomes stage three, blindness, spiritual blindness. Talking about physical blindness. 
See, here's a news flash for you. God is loving and merciful. That's not news, see? That's not news. We all believe that. I mean, in this story, who hasn't God shown mercy to? I mean, think about it. Who hasn't he shown mercy to? The sailors in the boat. He showed them mercy. Jonah in the fish. God showed him mercy. The Ninevites in their sin. God showed them mercy. See, it's important to understand what makes you angry and deal with it because misdirected anger will block out God's heart from your life. And Jonah well represented the heart of many of the Jews who could not forget the horrible offense the Assyrians had caused them, the horrific way they had treated the Jewish people and the other nations. They saw the destruction of the Ninevites as the only legitimate way to solve the Jewish problem known as Assyria. And the destruction of the Ninevites would have certainly solved the problem. Jonah didn't have the slightest interest in the Ninevites. But he also had a pretty good idea what God's resolution to the Jewish problem would be. Salvation based on repentance, which would also solve the Jewish problem. But it would be solved God's way. Well, the story should solve, solve at least one controversy, as we stated last weekend. And that is whether or not the God of the Bible is a bloodthirsty God who just likes to judge people. Because the truth is, God has always desired salvation for people. We oftentimes hear about people drawing a distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, the judgmental God of the Old Testament and the merciful God of the New Testament. And I remind them the story of Jonah is in the Old Testament. It's in all the stories. God's mercy is in all the stories. And let me assure you today, there is not two gods, a God of the Old and a God of the New Testament. There's only one God, and he's been consistently gracious to the world. The only difference between the Testaments is that the world got a better picture of God when Jesus came. Jesus is the final word on God's consistent commitment to extend grace to a sinful world. And the reason why I even strategically wanted you to write those two words, final word, your eternal destiny depends on your opinion about Jesus. That's it. And that brings us back to what we said last time. The world struggles with God's wrath. Our front row struggles with God's wrath. They only want to champion God's love. But God's wrath is not in spite of his love. It's, it's simply because of his love. If we were honest, some of us would have to admit we want Jesus to come back because we're sick and tired of people blaspheming God. We're just tired of it. We're like Jonah. We want someone to pay for how ridiculous things have gotten. And just like the Ninevites, they eventually will pay if they don't repent. When all the dust settles, nobody gets away with nothing. Remember that. When you watch the news and you see the blasphemies and you see the rebellion and you see the God's godlessness and in your spirit, it quickens your heart. You've got that orge, that, that discomfort with the fact that the world is going a different direction than God's plan for the world. And we think, oh man, that makes me so mad. I just feel like I want to punch somebody's lights out. Remember this. Nobody gets away with nothing. But God is pushing the calendar back as much as possible. Why? Because he's the same God today that Jonah served in chapter 4. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. The apostle Peter said, as some understand slowness, instead he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And that's why, and I'm not very popular maybe at times, 
And I say, maybe we shouldn't be praying, Lord, come quickly. Maybe we ought to be praying, Lord, there's somebody in my front row that doesn't know you yet. Can you please wait another day at least? Anyway, number four, step four, phase four, whatever. Rigidity. It wasn't the Ninevites God was after in this story. Just keep that in mind. He loved the Ninevites. Gracious and compassionate to save the Ninevites. But in this story, he's after one guy. His name is Jonah. And he wanted Jonah before his spiritual rigor mortis set in. Before he reached this point where he became stiff-necked, hard-hearted. God uses us to bring transformation to our oikos. But he will use our oikos to bring us, to draw us closer to him. And the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Remember, anger only blocks our abilities to see things logically. Jonah not only doesn't come around, he keeps getting more and more ticked off as the story evolves. I don't know if you know this, but at the biological level, anger hormones block out your ability to think logically. Actually suppress the logic center in your brain from functioning. When you're mad, you cannot make good decisions. An angry Jonah is not any less logical than angry you. Jonah had gone out, verse 5, sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter. He sat in the shade, waited to see what would happen to the city. I mean, look at that. Jonah says, I'm going to go sit outside the city as if nobody is good enough to share his space. He's going to remove himself from the city. He's not going to embrace those who have repented. He's not going to welcome them into the family of God. He's going to go out of the city and sit there and stew. And watch for the inevitability of his opinion to overtake God's opinion. What he's doing is he's waiting for the Ninevites to give up this foolish repentance idea and to get back to who they really are. Man, this thing's getting worse and worse. Verse 6, the Lord provided a leafy plant, made it grow over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. This is the first time in the entire story. This is the first time in four chapters Jonah has been happy about anything. And God is continuing to show mercy. And I'm sure, jo- I, I'm not sure about anything, but I think Jonah's probably thinking, finally God's starting to come around. But while Jonah is unhappy with hundreds of thousands of people's lives being saved, he's happy that he has a little plant giving him shade over his head. But the dawn the next day, at dawn the next day, verse 7, God provided a worm. And that worm chewed the plant and withered. And the sun rose, and God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head, so he grew faint, and he wanted to die. He's got this perpetual death wish. And he said, it'd be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? You're angry about a plant. And he said, what? It is. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant. You didn't tend it. You didn't make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. Listen to yourself, Jonah. You got more more concern for a plant than a city. Plant city. And should I, he says, God says, I'm not concerned for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. That 120,000 is a reference to Nineveh's children. There were 600,000 people in the city of Nineveh, 120,000 of them were kids. They couldn't, they couldn't tell the difference between their right and their left hand. They're just kids. God plays the kid card. 
What about the kids, Jonah? The Assyrians were famous for their disregard of children. Everybody knew that, including Jonah. And God says to Jonah, what makes you any better than them? And that's it. There's no verse 12. The story ends with a question, not an answer. We don't even know what happened to Jonah. But I believe there's a reason for that. Because this is not a story about Jonah, is it, really? It's a story about who? Us. I don't know how many people are in San Diego. I don't know how many people live near the community that you happen to live in. I don't know how far you drive in to come to Skyline Church. I don't know how many of them are kids. I don't know how many of them need Jesus. But it's amazing to me what we will find the time to do this week. Besides reaching out to them. Retaining the heart of God. I made a comment earlier, just kind of talking about Jesus being the final word. Final word on God's commitment to extend grace to a sinful world. There may be some of you in this room or in one of the other rooms at the other campuses, and you have n- never given your heart to Christ. That decision weighs heavily on God's heart. And it weighs heavily on my heart. And I don't even know you. And it weighs heavily on the heart of the person who extended an invitation for you to come to Skyline Church. Because what you do with Jesus ultimately is all that matters. And so I would like to invite you to open your heart to him as we close. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I pray for those who are who are in need, Lord, of Jesus today. I just pray that uh, their spiritual eyes would be opened to the gracious and compassionate God that you are. When I think of the fact that you could have returned in your glory yesterday, but you did not do that. You waited another day at least. And my friend, if, if you're without Jesus today, do not try his patience any longer. He loves you and he brought you to this place to open your heart, to admit your sin, to believe that Jesus is the only savior of the world and to choose to place your faith in Christ. I encourage you to pray that prayer even now. Lord, I receive you into my life as my Savior. I'm a sinner who can't make it on my own. I I believe, I somehow always believe that you are the Savior of the world, but right now I choose to give you my life. And for those of us who have known Jesus for a long time, are we willing to move forward today and retain that that heart posture of loving people more than plants, loving people more than fill in the blank, to extend an invitation to Easter. What an opportunity. Extend that invitation, not as a matter of outward obedience, but from our hearts wanting people to repent and to know Jesus. And I pray for Skyline Church family, Lord, and your children all over the world, that this week would be a resurgence of your heart in our hearts. And uh, we pray that the celebration we share together next week would be more complete because of what we were able to watch you do in our own front rows In Jesus' great name, all God's children said, amen. Well, Skyline, thank you. And now to him who was able to do exceeding abundantly beyond anything at all you could ever ask or even imagine, 
according to his power that is in you and me. You are dismissed. Have a great week. Just when I